I've developed this lecture for students who are enrolled in sort of an introduction to economics class or a very lower level macro microeconomics course. Now, I've designed all of my lectures for non-economic majors. The everyday student who has to take economics but may not be looking to major in this field. However, you still need to pass the course. If you find this video helpful, I strongly recommend that you check out the companion video for this lecture series where I cover most common questions and problems that you might incur in your schoolwork, quizzes, or exams. Now this specific lecture is going to be focusing on understanding the effects of specialization, absolute advantage, determining oppor opportunity costs, a little hard for me to say this morning, mathematically, and comparative advantage. Now also, let's be honest, you're going to need some paper and a simple calculator because we are heading into math at this point. So let's get going. Without trade, much of your everyday activities would be really different. I mean, think about it. For most of you, you didn't get up this morning and go out and water and raise the cotton and then take that cotton and weave it into some yarn and then take that yarn and weave it into some fabric. And then once you had fabric, you didn't sit around and sew the clothing that you're wearing. No, it's trade that allows us to have most of the items that we are interacting with on a daily basis and use. So let's take a closer look at this interaction with two sort of main characters for this particular lecture. We're gonna have Farmer Bill here. It looks a little like my brother, why is Bill? He grows some really wonderful tomato plants. And we have Farmer Nancy, who sort of looks like my friend Nancy, and she raises eggs. Now, at first, Farmer Bill is very happy with his tomatoes and he eats lots of tomato soup. And Farmer Nancy, she loves scrambled eggs, so she's fine in eating scrambled eggs. But after a couple of months, they start to get a little bored with their limited diets. You know, one day they're both at the edge of their land. They run into each other and Nancy talks about how making tomato omelets would be really tasty. And Farmer Bill starts thinking about how poached eggs with a spicy tomato sauce would make his day. So now what is going to happen is that Nancy is going to go plant some tomatoes and Farmer Bill is going to build a chicken coop. But the question is, is this really the most effective thing for each of them to do? Let's take a look. So here we go. We got Farmer Bill and Farmer Nancy. Now they're both working eight hours a day. They're going to measure their production. They want to see how effective they've been. So we're going to measure production in ounces and we're going to measure time in minutes. Now both of these are pretty common to use when we're talking about measuring productivity. So what we find is for Bill, it's going to take him about 60 minutes to produce one ounce of eggs and 15 minutes to produce an ounce of tomatoes. So if he works basically an eight hour day and he only produces eggs, he could produce eight ounces. And if he only produces tomatoes, he could produce 32 ounces a day. Nancy does sort of the same thing, but it only takes her 20 minutes to produce an ounce of eggs and only 10 minutes to produce an ounce of tomatoes. So she's figured out she can do 24 ounces of eggs in a day and 48 ounces of tomatoes in a day. Now we're going to take this information and we're going to put it into a chart because a charts are going to be a lot easier to see than this. So basically for Bill, this is going to be his chart. And what you see here is eggs versus tomatoes. So the reason for the zeros is remember, we're saying is that if he produces no tomatoes at all, he would produce eight ounces of eggs. So if we do the same thing for Nancy, this is basically what her chart is going to look like. Now we have some coordinate pairs. So we have a couple of coordinate pairs here. Now you may be asking, well, what is this middle number? Why do we have a four ounce one here? Well, if we think about it, we said that each one wants to do some production of eggs and some production of tomatoes. So we're going to make the assumption that they divide their time evenly. And if they divide their time evenly, four hours to eggs and four hours to tomatoes, this is what they'd be able to produce based on what we've already discovered but we can plot this point out. So with Farmer Bill, we can see our PPF here plot line. We know that if he's only producing eggs, he's going to be at this location. And if he's only producing tomatoes, he's gonna to be down here. This is what his current basic uh, productivity and consumption is. Now the key there is productivity and consumption. And we're going to do the same thing for Nancy. We've got our basic spot here and she also is going to have a production and consumption spot 
Now, at first, when you look at these two, it looks like they're doing exactly the same thing. And I've done this on purpose because what you may not have noticed is that the scaling is different. So the scale here versus the scale here is very different. It's going to be really important that you pay attention to the scaling when you look at anything. Because if we were to superimpose basically Bill's uh, production on top of Nancy's production using the scaling for Nancy, we're going to see that Bill is much lower than what Nancy is. And his angle or his slope of his line is very different. So remember, you always want to double check what the scaling is because it might look the same, but the scales could make everything very different. But now we've got two PPFs for both of these people. So let's move on and see how that helps us understand things. So Bill is happily growing tomatoes and raising chickens. And one day Nancy comes over and says, hey, Bill, you know, my son and I, we've been talking. He really likes the tomatoes and eggs together. The problem is, is that my tomato plants are so much smaller and scrawnier than yours. And I just don't seem to have the land as good as your land to grow tomatoes. So my son, well, he was working on the computer the other day and he was figuring some stuff out and he said, you know, mom, if you trade with Bill, we might all come out better. Bill says, well, tell me what you're talking about. So she says, well, if you grow just tomatoes, we know you can grow 32 ounces in one day. And what I'll do is I will give you five ounces of eggs if out of those 32 ounces, you give me 15 ounces of tomatoes. So Bill thinks about this for a second because here's his production curve. And we can see down here at the bottom that that's true. If he was to grow just eggs, he would have those 32 ounces. And so his current production though at four hours of doing one of each is four ounces of eggs and 16 ounces of tomatoes. And he figures, well, if I grow 32 ounces of tomatoes, I give her 15 ounces, I would still have 17 ounces of tomato. So he compares her office to what his current offer is. And he says, you know, this is really good because I'm going to wind up having more eggs and more tomatoes than what I'm currently doing with my current four hours. Now, that's going to be his new consumption at the green point, but he's going to have a new production level. The new production level is down there at the bottom of the red line. Now, remember, the red line is his PPF. This is what he can do. Now, consumption can be outside of the PPF, but production has to be either on or inside that line. Now, Bill's a good guy. He says, this sounds really good to me, but Nancy, what about you? Is this going to help you? Nancy says, sure. So he gets rid of his chicken coop right away. Boom, he's happy. It's gone. And she says, well, look at this. Here's my current production. And I know that if I was to maybe change my production around a little bit, I'm going to come out good because I'm currently spending four hours making eggs and four hours making tomatoes, and I've got 12 and 24 ounces. But what's going to happen is I'm going to start raising chickens for six hours, and I'm only going to grow tomatoes for two hours. So I'm going to hit a new production level. And my new production level is going to be 18 ounces of eggs and 12 ounces of tomatoes. But from those 18 ounces, I am going to have to take five ounces and give that to you, which will leave me 13 ounces of eggs. But I'm going to add 15 ounces of tomatoes. So that will give me 27 ounces of tomato sauce. And if I chart that, this means I'm going to have a new consumption level. And that new consumption level is going to be beyond my curve. So I'm doing better than I was doing before. Each of us are going to be able to consume at a higher level than we were consuming before, but we're going to still be able to be within the production that we're both capable of. Bill says this sounds like a good idea to him. And so they decide to go ahead and agree to trade. So let's see if you can answer a couple of questions about this now. Here are the two PPF curves that we just saw in the last slide. It doesn't have a lot of the other arrows and things like this, but you actually don't need any more than this information to answer both of these questions. Give me a second to see if you can come up with the answer. So the first one's asking about before they do the trade, which statement is correct? Well, they're both consuming at the point on their PPF. What happens after their trade? They're now both consuming at a point outside their PPF. 
Now, for a moment, you might say, but you can't do anything outside the PPF. Ah, uh, but you can. You can't produce outside your PPF, but you can consume outside with trade. So remember that when we looked at Bill's choice, if he's doing the after, he was producing down at this level. And if we looked over at Nancy, her after was producing somewhere around here. So they were still producing on their PPF, but their consumption had moved beyond. This is the advantage of trade. It allows you to produce what you can produce, but it allows you to consume more than what you would have been able to do on your own. Now, you might kind of have a puzzling question in your head. I mean, how can Farmer Bill be better than Nancy at doing anything? After all, if we take a look at the data that we have, it would seem that Nancy is faster at basically making eggs and tomatoes because in eight hours she can produce more than Farmer Bill. However, the question in economics is not who can do it faster, but who can produce at a lower cost? And there are two types of costs that we tend to look at. One is absolute advantage and the other is opportunity cost. So let's take a look at absolute advantage first. Now, absolute advantage is the ability to produce a good using fewer inputs than another person. Now this person could be an individual. So think LeBron James in basketball. Could be a company. Many would argue that Amazon for home delivery would be a good example. It can even be a region like the southern U.S. for fried chicken or a country, Guatemala in growing bananas due to its climate. Absolute advantage measures the cost of a good in terms of the input required to produce it. So the farmer who needs a smaller quantity of input to produce a product will always have the absolute advantage in producing their particular product. Now the only input for our example was time. But in the real world, we might have to look at Farmer Bill and the cost of seed. And for Nancy, maybe the cost of feed. But concentrating on our farmers, have you figured out who has the absolute advantage? Well, if you picked Farmer Nancy, you're correct. She requires less time to produce both eggs and tomatoes compared to Farmer Bill. But remember, we said there were two different types of cost. So let's take a quick look at opportunity cost. Now, we've talked about this before. So remember, it's whatever you give up in order to obtain something else. So we kind of want to take a look at a chart here. And we're going to look at the opportunity cost of production for these two people based on the ounces. And what we see here is that for Bill, basically to produce eggs, for every ounce of eggs he wants to produce, he's going to have to give up four ounces of tomatoes right here. And for Nancy to produce eggs, she's going to have to give up two ounces of tomatoes. And on the other hand, if these people want to produce more tomatoes, they're either going to have to give up a quarter ounce of eggs or a half ounce of eggs. So their opportunity costs look a lot different than basically their absolute value costs. So in economics, what we tend to look at is this concept called competitive advantage. Now, this is used when we're comparing the opportunity costs of two or more producers. The competitive advantage is the ability to produce a good at a lower opportunity cost than the other producer. So let's look at this concept in play here. We've got basically Bill, who's going to have to give up a quarter of the whole of his production if he wants to produce more tomatoes. Whereas Nancy is going to have to give up half of her production if she wants to produce more tomatoes. So, you know, this may not work out so well for Nancy because she has to give up a lot more than basically Bill will. We can look at this another way too. The opportunity cost for Bill is far smaller than the opportunity cost for Nancy when it comes to producing tomatoes. His cost of a quarter of an ounce versus a half ounce. Bill has a competitive advantage when it comes to growing tomatoes. Nancy, she's going to have a competitive advantage when it comes to growing eggs. And we can see that here because for every basic egg that she wants to grow, she's only going to lose two ounces of tomatoes, where Bill is going to lose four ounces of tomatoes. So what becomes really important when it comes to opportunity is to see who gives up the least.
this person gives up the least and this person gives up the least. That means that for these two people, they're able to produce at a higher level than the other people. So they have the competitive advantage. Now, when you go to work problems, look at our companion video for this, you're going to see that this turns out to be correct every single time. What we want to know is one person will always have a competitive advantage. However, one person can have all the absolute advantage. So let me restate that a little bit clearer. When we looked at our example here, Nancy had an absolute advantage in both growing eggs and tomatoes because she could grow both faster with less input. But when it came to comparative advantage, only one person can have an advantage in each product. So remember, we said that Nancy, she had the advantage in eggs and we know that Bill had the advantage in tomatoes. Why? Because remember, and I keep saying remember, but what it is, is it's all about who loses the least when they change their products. I'm going to have to move on, but I think this will get clearer as we go. And again, the companion video will actually work you through some of these problems. Let's take a little bit closer look at comparative advantage, because this is a big concept in economics. First of all, it's based on the fact that we normally look at trade as being fair. And if trade is fair, then everybody in a society should gain from the concept of trade. Because as we saw with Bill, if he's concentrating on what he does best and he trades with somebody else with what they do best, he winds up having a higher consumption rate, but still being producing on his maximum ability to produce on the PPF. So what we know, if we really look at this, it's going to be comparative advantage that really is going to show us the concept of why trade is a benefit to everybody, not absolute advantage. And I would be prepared for that on a test. I'm pretty certain that's going to be sort of a standard question in almost all economics classes. And that if production society is based on comparative advantage, if we make those decisions that we're going to look at what we do best and that's what we're going to produce, then the entire economy is going to increase for that society rather than being fragmented as we saw with Farmer Bill and Farmer Nancy. So let's take a look again at the trade. So Farmer Nancy is going to give Bill five ounces of eggs and Farmer Bill is going to give Nancy 10 ounces of tomatoes. And so that sort of worked out to look like this. Now remember, production was based on one ounce and time was based on uh, minutes. And so what we found is that for the opportunity costs, that it was going to basically um, be harder for Bill to give up tomatoes than it was going to be for Nancy. And it was going to be harder for Nancy to give up eggs than it was going to be Bill. Why? Well, remember, it all depended on basically who had to give up more. So these two people had to give up more than the other two people if they were to switch over to producing tomatoes or switch over to producing eggs. You know, the other way you can look at this, because your book often says is, you know, who's going to have the least amount of problems if, um, they were to switch over. It doesn't really matter which way you look at it. It still comes out with the same answer. And it's a pretty easy answer to see because if we think about it. If I'm going to go switch over to eggs, then I'm going to lose four ounces of tomatoes for every egg I gain according to opportunity costs. So how does that break down with having trade? Because what you see here is without trade, no trade at all. So once we have trade, we're going to see that things change because here we're now looking at I'm going to be Farmer Bill and I'm going to um, basically only produce tomatoes. But we calculated basically what the cost would be for eggs by taking the time, which was 15 minutes per egg and the amount of eggs that we saw three ounces for the cost with trade versus four ounces 
for the cost before the trade. So you can see that sort of pointing right up there. So in both cases, what we found was that the farmer becomes basically better off if they have trade because they're going to be able to get more ounces of the other material. Now, how that trade is calculated and what they should do will be different from person to person. Remember for Farmer Bill, he had to completely give up making eggs at all, whereas Farmer Nancy was still going to grow some tomatoes, but she was going to focus more on the chicken. Now, that little hint that came up, I'm going to tell you that sometimes students have uh, difficulty remembering which one you divide what by. And if you go to the companion video, which I would highly recommend in this case, we're going to be calculating a lot of opportunity costs. So just remember you divide what is given up by what is gained to go ahead and get that opportunity cost. When we talk about trade, we have to mention price. And we already talked about that there's sort of two things that we look at, absolute advantage and comparative advantage. And we already know that comparative advantage is going to be the deciding factor. And that's decided based on opportunity costs. So for a trade to happen, it must fall between the party's opportunity costs. So what we're saying is, is here's the opportunity cost that we have for Farmer Bill and Farmer Nancy. We've calculated this already. We've seen it several times. And we're saying for them to trade, it basically for both of them now, again, the key word here is for both parties to want to do the trade, the cost must fall between these two spots. And we saw on a couple of slides before that that was true. But let's just say that Farmer Bill, um, his son has taken over the farm. It's been a couple of years. And so Farmer Bill Jr. comes along and he says to Farmer Nancy, I'd like to renegotiate our trade deal. Um, I've got a bigger family and the truth is, is I want more ounces of eggs. So I'll tell you what, if you give me 10 ounces of eggs, um, I will continue to give you 15 ounces of tomatoes. I think my tomatoes are so worth doing this that you ought to do this. So Nancy's going to go home to her smart son on this little computer there and they're going to figure out what this costs are going to be. And so when she looks at the cost of the eggs, well, you know, this works out basically in, in Farmer Bill's Jr.'s favor because before the trade, it was four ounces and now it's only 1.5 ounces. But for Farmer Nancy, this isn't going to be a good trade because her costs now are going to go up. They go up to two thirds of an ounce. And so that rise from a half an ounce to two thirds of an ounce actually puts her at a disadvantage. So she won't want to do the trade. Of course, Bill wants to do the trade because, well, it's lowered his costs. I mean, it's lowered his costs dramatically if you really look at this. So Nancy's being a little pissed off about this, saying, oh, he's trying to rip me off. And she comes back and she says, I'll tell you what, Farmer Bill Jr., I will give you 10 ounces of eggs for your growing family, but I want 40 ounces of tomatoes. And so Bill is going to have to figure out if this is good for him. Now, the thing is, is that it might be a good trade, or at least an okay trade, because what we notice is that for Bill Jr., it's going to trade him four ounces and it used to cost him four ounces. So actually the cost of the trade hasn't changed at all for him, but the cost of the trade for Nancy is good because it's now only a quarter of an ounce where it used to be a half an ounce. So Bill will have to decide, Bill Jr. here, if it is worth the trade to get those extra ounces of eggs because it hasn't changed his cost. He may or may not want to do it, which is why there's a question mark. But for Nancy, no question. If they renegotiate this deal, it works out better in his favor. Now, there's a good chance he'll take this because it hasn't changed his cost at all, but he's going to get an increase in the amount of eggs that he had before. So we'll talk a lot more about trade and price as we get into it because there's a lot of detail with that that we need to understand some other concepts first. But this gives you sort of a general overview of that. Let's look at a question that you might get tossed out either in class or maybe a homework question that kind of combines both. And you're given a situation where you have these twins who have uh, split jobs. We've got dog walkers, we've got leaf rakers, and we're given some information here. We know that we're measuring this in one hour increments. 
they're both working eight hours a day and we're given how fast each person can do something. This is all information that we need to know because they're going to ask you a couple of questions on this. So maybe the first question they ask you is who has the absolute advantage in each one? Super simple to solve. You just set yourself up a really quick little diagram over here. Now I'm always a big one for setting up a quick box because my eyes might drift to the wrong answer. We tend to jump to things, but if we look over here, we remember absolute advantage is who can produce the most with the input. So the input here is time. And we can see that Emma is going to be much more productive than Liam is when it comes to raking for an hour. But when it comes to dog walking, they're kind of equal. No one person has a competitive or an absolute advantage, I should say. So the answer is D in this case. I see I was jumping ahead myself a little bit. So the next question is, is the comparative advantage. Who has the advantage in raking? Who has it in lawns? And in this case, we have to figure out the opportunity cost. And so you're going to set yourself up your little chart and here's your opportunity cost. Just remember that when you're calculating opportunity costs, it's what you've given up divided by what is gained. That's usually where students make a mistake as they've got it flipped the wrong way around. But when we look at this, we can see that Emma is going to give up a lot less than Liam is when it comes to raking. And when it comes to dog walking, it's going to be Liam who gives up less than Emma. And we're looking for the person who gives up the least because that means that they're the most effective at this. So in this case, the answer is pretty clear that it's going to be Emma in raking and Liam in dog walking. The one thing you do have to remember though is that unlike an absolute advantage, when it comes to comparative advantage, only one person will have a comparative advantage in each product and it will be the opposite person. So if you figured out that Emma had it in raking, then it had to be Liam and dog walking. You might also be seeing a question that looks like this, you know, what's the most effective business model they could have, you know, who should do what? Basically, you're going to figure out your opportunity costs just like you did for the question above. And of course, your answer would be Emma and Liam in those two spots. So here's kind of a fun question for you. Uh, we talked about that you know, we could do opportunity costs even for individuals. So I'm going to use Usain Bolt, our fastest man in the world. And because he's the fastest man in the world, we're also going to assume he's the fastest lawnmower person in the world. So should he mow his own lawn? Now, this is actually a picture of the lawn that he has when he was in Australia playing professional soccer. Basically, here's your scenario. We've got good old Oliver over here. You know, he's making $15 an hour, but he could be earning $50 an hour mowing lawns for Usain. However, Usain can mow this yard faster than Oliver can. So Usain does have the absolute advantage because he can mow the lawn in one hour. That would take Oliver three hours. You, Usain would have basically this lower input of time, thus the absolute advantage. But does he have the comparative advantage? Well, there we can say no, because Usain, literally can earn up to $400,000 for showing up at a track event. And so if he can earn $400,000 as a track event, which is basically $65,000 an hour, assuming that he only goes for six hours, because that's how long most track events are in a day. And Oliver is basically making $45 as his opportunity cost. So when we look at this, it doesn't make sense for Usain Bolt to actually sort of mow his own yards because he'd be far better off by paying somebody else. Now, this is just a fun way to look at the concepts that we've learned today. Understand the same principles learned here could be applied to whether you're reviewing the United States should trade Guatemala for bananas because we know Guatemala has better climate than us and the U.S. has you know, better climates for growing corn. It has to do with the climate and bananas are basically Guatemala's thing and they can specialize in that compared to us who really specialize in corn. So this interdependency of living that we have has a great advantage for both societies and for individuals in both societies when trade occurs.
Now that I've covered the lecture on this material, I really recommend that you click over and watch the companion video. The companion video is a little bit long, it's over an hour, but what it's going to do is go through a ton of different types of math questions that you would be presented if you're being tested on this material. And having sort of a preview of how these questions are laid out to you, you're going to see that they're much easier to answer than they look like they are. Some of them look very complex, but when you really stop and start to work through them, they're not as complex as they look. So what you could do is always, of course, just scroll through the ones that you already look at and you go, oh, I know how to solve that one, I know how to solve that one. But just make sure that you do have the ability to have a basic knowledge of how to approach and solve each question. Well, until next time, keep learning.